Hello, I'm Brian with GlutenFreeHomeBrewing.com. Today we're very determined to make this next episode of uh, this series. Our uh, batteries died and then it started raining and then our memory card got filled. Um, but we're going to uh, do this again and um, maybe I've worked out some of the kinks this time. So if you're following on uh, YouTube, hop over to our blog. Uh, there's uh, the recipes on there. The original recipe is, uh, there's a link to that. You're, wanna, you're probably going to want to click on that. Click on the individual malts, it'll take you to the uh, malt profile, and we're going to be covering that today. Um, before we get into that, we should probably talk about our knowledge of um, malts and, and how we um, kind of build up our own personal uh, inventory and experience with malts, um, or any ingredient for that matter. Since we can't actually work with conventional malts, we heavily rely on um, things like the malt profile. Um, our, the advantage that we have ourselves uh, is that we can definitely work with the gluten-free malts. We can uh, taste them. We can uh, uh, taste them in the mash and in the, in the boil and see how they, they attribute to the overall flavor in the wort and then the finished beer. Um, but when you open a bag of malt, you're probably going to smell something. Uh, that's going to be different from one malt to the other. Sometimes the color can't really tell you that much about them because uh, there's some similar um, um, colors, particularly with like the, the paler uh, biscuit malts. I'm sorry, paler um, millet malts. Um, but you can definitely smell, and if, you, and if you can't tell from smelling them, you can definitely tell them from tasting them. You can taste the difference between a Vienna and a Munich. You can taste the difference between a, a Munich and a, a Cara millet. Um, so, we really want to increase our knowledge of our working knowledge of the different malts that we're going to be working with because when we read a malt profile and I've highlighted some things that I want to pull out of them we are really going to have to think about um, what malts we're going to have to use to achieve a similar uh, uh, flavor profile as the conventional malts and it's not always going to be a one to one. You're not always going to be able to get away with, oh, I'll substitute this one malt for this one gluten-free malt. It might take the combined uh, flavor profile of multiple gluten-free malts to be equal to um, the flavor profile of a combination of, of conventional malts. Um, beginning with, let's talk about the base malt, which in this case is the two-row brewer's malt. Um, they note that this is the most popular base malt for home brewing. Uh, it's smoother, more malty flavor without any excessive tannic bitterness. Uh, with our base malts, we are primarily looking at um, the rice and millet uh, pale malt, uh, but we also have the Munich and Vienna. Um, we use a high percentage of biscuit um, in a lot of our grain bills because we really like the uh, tones that the biscuit attributes to uh, the grain bill, um, but uh, we know that there are so many different types of conventional malts. I, I think I mentioned this in the last episode where I downloaded a spreadsheet and there were 300 something types of uh, conventional malts and we're working with just a few, a few dozen. Uh, so. While there probably are some very s similar um, uh, malts in that 300, particularly since we have um, different malt houses that are producing some similar beers, um, there still definitely is an advantage of how many varieties of malts there are for conventional malts, and we have to work, use our working knowledge of gluten-free malts to achieve these flavor profiles. Uh, sometimes that's gonna be easier than, than other times. Sometimes it might be a little challenging. Uh, let's talk about the Victoria malt. Um, they say that's similar to biscuit malt. And now would be a good time to point out that when we say biscuit malt or crystal malt or Munich malt, we're talking about their malt. And the profile that we're reading is how they describe their malt. Um, that's not to, we shouldn't assume that Munich is going to taste like Munich from one company to another. While there should be some very 
uh, very similar flavor profiles, um, there's definitely going to be some differences as well. Um, so let's just make sure that we're not uh, making the assumptions that they're the same thing, particularly since the language is somewhat um, overlapping. Um, that can be confusing. I talked to a customer recently that, that found that a little confusing. Makes sense now, but at the time didn't make sense um, that we were kind of interchangeably using the same terminology or, or name in that case. Um, going back to the Victoria malt, um, they described it as uh, flavors of biscuit and bread. Uh, it doesn't have any of the raw doughy-like flavors of their biscuit malt. Uh, it's more nutty, wafts of warm baking bread contributes um, to a heavy golden or dark uh, amber. So that's one of the malts that we need to figure out how we're going to substitute this. They're also using Crystal 60L. Uh, that's one of their most common um, uh, crystal or, or caramel malts in the barley world. Um, it adds color, complexity, better head retention. Again, that's their malt, not necessarily the gluten-free equivalent. Uh, adds a rich, sweet flavor that is predom predominantly caramel. Uh, adds a color of, of deep yellow to warm reds, depending on how much we use. So we're going to um, have to find some combination of malts that will achieve that as well. And then lastly is the Munich 10L. Um, rich, multi flavors. Um, more depth and complexity for fuller beers, uh, can be used in small amounts to open up the maltiness of lighter beers, uh, adds a beautiful golden white amber uh, color to the beer, um, and that's the four malts that we need to work on replacing. So again, we're probably going to ha have to think about this in terms of overall flavor profile of these malts in this grain bill and, and total overall um, flavor profile of the gluten-free malts that we're going to, to use um, in place of them. Um, some examples I can give just off the top of my head, the Victoria, it talks about it being similar to a biscuit malt. We have experience working with our biscuit malt and a lot of those uh, flavor profiles that they noted, that description that they noted, um, there's some but definitely some similarities to the biscuit malt. Um, the crystal, uh, some options there as well. Um, the thing that is challenging sometimes is that this is a 60L, so it's a darker malt. We're not going to get that with the gluten-free malts. If color is something, if you're trying to really recreate this, uh, this recipe as it is, then um, we might want to think about using like a um, James's brown malt, uh, the rice malt that um, kind of touches on a couple different malt styles. Um, it can be used kind of like a crystal malt um, in that it definitely has the color, it definitely has some of that residual sweetness, um, but it also has some other flavor characteristics that isn't true of, of a crystal malt. So it might make it go a little bit chocolate, but that isn't true. That's something that we don't want to introduce to this particular beer style. Um, if we're not concerned about color, we could stick to something uh, like a crystal or a uh, golden finch or um, could use caramel but uh, that has a lot of residual sweetness so you'd want to use uh, probably a smaller amount of that. Um, with the Munich for example um, it's a lighter malt so it's a 10 L so we don't have that same problem that we have with the crystal so maybe we can do a pretty close you know one-to-one -one exchange of our Munich versus their Munich because um, we don't have those other variables that we need to contend with. Um, we know our Munich, uh, the, uh, the Munich malt, uh, millet malt from Grouse is a very um, malt forward, um, aromatic, great aroma, a great malty flavor. Um, but from my experience working with it, um, it tends to have used in a large quantity. Um, it sometimes it attributes kind of like um, kind of like an apricot sort of flavor to it sometimes, depending on, again, if you use a lot. So these are all sort of things that we want to take in consideration. Um, glancing back from the recipe, we're, we're trying to replace two pounds of base malt, two pounds of the Munich, a pound of the, of the Crystal, and half a pound of the Victoria. So we don't really have to worry too much about um, any of that uh, apricot sort of flavor coming through on the Munich because we're not using that much and, and it's probably not going to be an issue. 
Um, to get to the color that this recipe calls for, uh, we might have to go with like the James Brown uh, rice malt to get the color if we want to be true to um, the full, um, uh, to all the numbers in, in this beer. Um, and it doesn't call for very much of the victory malt and we tend to like to use a, a high percentage of biscuit malt so um, maybe we decide to use more biscuit malt than the original recipe uh, calls for. So in making our decision we're going to have to decide do we want to really try and recreate this recipe by the numbers, by the book, true to style as closely as we can and we'll really never know if it is unless somebody brews another beer and does a side-by-side -side taste test. Um, which if, and I've had customers contact me saying, hey, I really liked this beer when I uh, wasn't gluten-free. I want to recreate it again. I want to have that beer. Um, and they can buy it in a store and have their friends taste it. And they can brew a batch of their gluten-free version, have their friend do a taste test, and we, we can eventually get there. Um, that's not always the case, particularly when it's a home-brewed beer and not something to market. Um, another thing to consider is, is how much do we really care about being reproducing this or recreating this beer uh, the recipe exactly as it is. Maybe we are, uh, find inspiration in it, but we don't need to necessarily uh, make a clone of it. And we can uh, work with the grain bill and say, I like this, but you know, if I were making it, I would maybe go this way with, with the beer. Um, so those are all some options going forward. So I know I talked um, pretty quickly and moved through a lot of this material really quickly just now. Um, I've had a couple takes to, to do that since the first few didn't work out with the battery in the rain and the uh, memory card. Um, but I think this uh, kind of covered everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, in our next episode, we're going to discuss what malts we're going to use. And I would encourage you to um, follow along and, and come up with your own grain bill. We can kind of work on this together. Um, I suspect um, my recommendations might be different than what you come up with. Um, part, part of that has to do with we all have our own style. Uh, we might have different experience with the malts. Um, if you're not already tasting the malts, again, start with like your next brew or go find whatever malts you have laying around and, and taste them. I encourage you to do that. Um, I do have to throw out one disclaimer there, please don't chip a tooth, we're not going to be responsible for any dental bills, uh, so maybe mill it, um, and uh, uh, rice, the rice seeds are definitely the toughest, but the rest um, are pretty, pretty soft and I don't think we have to worry about that. But uh, that's, that's where we're going to leave things today. Um, again, follow us on our blog and um, we are probably on this episode, you're not going to see anything new down below. Um, I might just summarize some notes that we discussed, uh, but in our next episode, we're going to have um, our grain bill that we create together. So we're going to have the original uh, conventional grain bill, and then we're going to have the gluten-free um, uh, version of that grain bill. So thanks for watching. Again, I'm Brian with Gluten-Free homebrewing.com.